Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Milstead. I work for a company called Ondat, which is a uh, container um, storage solution that runs inside Kubernetes. So turn your Kubernetes cluster into kind of a storage array. And I'm here presenting with... Rova, one, two, three. Okay, good. Hi, I'm Gabriele Bartolini. As you, as you have may guessed, I'm from Italy. I work for EDB, which is one of the major contributors to the PostgreSQL open source project. I'm vice president and CTO of Cloud Native. And my primary goal in the organization is to enhance the Postgres experience in the Kubernetes space. I, I'm an active uh, member of the Postgres community and I've been working for, with Postgres for over two, dec uh, two decades. I, I'm an early adopter of the, the DevOps culture and uh, here today I will briefly cover the Cloud Native PG uh, open source operator while Chris will primarily talk about the storage part. Between us, hopefully you find it interesting. So we're going to try and do a bit about kind of the intro, set the scene, then we're going to do a, a lot about the Postgres patterns. And then we're going to try and do a little demo at the end, which uh, I have recorded it. Because anyone in Valencia know what the Wi-Fi was like? Trying to do a live demo was absolutely impossible. So we've gone for the backup safe video. But it is running on my laptop. So if anyone does want to come and see it in real life, come and find me either here afterwards or at the booth. And we'll go through it and do it again. And as you can see by the picture, EDB had a party last night. And there might have been some alcohol <laughs> served. And uh, yeah, we, we don't look like that normally in real life. So the first part is. Um, the clicker's not clicking. There we go. We're on there. So um, the first part is um, there was a talk previously to this one, which was you know data on Kubernetes, um, bring it on. So we're not going to try and convince you to put data in Kubernetes. We're going to assume that you're all given in this room that this is the case. But if you are interested and want to know more, both of our companies are very active members and proud supporters of the data on Kubernetes. And they've got these great reports. So if you or your boss or your teams or anyone is interested in convincing people to run data in Kubernetes, please go and download this report. There's a QR code in the bottom right-hand side and the slides, which you can click on that, and you'll get access to the report. Anything else you want to say about that one, Gabrielli? That's fine. No, no, that, you, said, you said everything. Thank you. It's all good. Um, boring words on a slide. Um, the takeaway from this slide is that by putting your data into Kubernetes, none of your resiliency problems change. You still have to think about exactly the same problems, but it's a lot easier and there's a lot of nice automation and things that happen either from the Kubernetes side or from the cloud native Postgres operator side to make your job a lot easier. So it is much easier to automate and get this all to work without having to spend you know, months and sacrificing whatever animals your country uh, would do. But the, the main thing which I'm going to just leave you is the bottom, two li bottom three acronyms. So the maximum tolerable downtime. The first thing you do when you start looking at your resilience is you say, what is the business willing to put up with and what will the business pay to protect against? This is a business and application level question. And then that leads you onto the two technical things, your recovery time objective and your recovery point objective. How much data can I afford to lose in the event of an outage? And how long have I got to get the systems back up and running? So we're going to try and frame kind of the different scenarios and the different patterns we're going to talk about in these different terminologies. But the big key thing for me is resiliency. Nothing changes if you're running in Kubernetes. You still have to do exactly the same kind of uh, thinking about it. And with that, I think we're going to jump onto some patterns. So I'm going to hand yeah, the I'll clicker back to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chris. So uh, this is tough, OK, because I'm trying to put PostgreSQL in one slide. And you know, having also an, a former core member of Postgres here, you know, uh, you know th this is going to be tough. But anyway, I want to ask, who's in this room already using PostgreSQL in production? Wow, OK. And now, now keep your hand up, please. And who's do, using that in Kubernetes? And I, see, I see many hands going down. OK, so uh, hopefully you, know, you are convinced after this talk that this is not only possible, but as I define it, that's the best overall, overall experience of PostgreSQL. OK, I think that Postgres Kubernetes work very well. So for those of you who instead are not familiar with PostgreSQL, or simply Postgres, 
It's one of the most successful and innovative open source uh, projects ever. So it's um, one of the most popular database management systems, as we can also see from, uh, from this room today, but especially in virtualized and bare metal environment. And according to a recent uh, survey from Stack Overflow, it's the most loved database by uh, developers. However, I feel it's important to restate some of the extraordinary capabilities that come out of the box with Postgres. Many enterprise level features that have been consistently introduced in the project year after year, one major release after the other. PostgreSQL implements the primary standby architecture with a single primary and uh, um, an optional number of read-only replicas suitable for high availability and read scalability uh, purposes. This is possible through its native streaming replication protocol, which is available in different, different flavors. Physical, logical, asynchronous, and synchronous. By the way, even at, at transaction level, you can set these, uh, these stuff. So, and also cascading. Postgres also supports uh, file-based replication which is extremely useful in multi-region uh, setups, especially when used in conjunction with object stores in the cloud. Then we've got continuous backup and point-in-time recovery that completes, complete the business continuity uh, requirements, enabling it to achieve RPO zero and very low RTOs in several disaster scenarios. My list of favorite features includes also declarative partitioning for horizontal, horizontal table partitioning, Parallel queries for vertical scalability, extensibilities, think about extensions like PostJS, for example, for geographical databases. JSON support for multimodal hybrid databases, IC transactions, transactional DDL, and least but last but not least, SQL standard compliance. Obviously, there are many, many more, but if you think that the project has been steadily innovating for at least uh, 25 plus years, okay? And the community just released version 15 with, and I'm really proud to say that, many contributions from uh, ADB. And please raise your hand if you've ever heard of Cloud Native PG. Yeah, a few people, okay. So hopefully by today you'll know more. So Cloud Native PG is technically a level five Kubernetes operator that can manage, manage PostgreSQL clusters and it is production ready. There are a few operators for Postgres uh, out there, but Cloud Native PG is fundamentally different from the rest. Okay, it's open source, it's distributed under Apache License 2.0, but in May this year, uh, its, its intellectual, intellectual property has been donated by EDB to a vendor neutral and openly governed uh, community with the long-term aspiration to pursue the CNCF graduation process. We've applied to the CNCF sandbox, and we are currently in the review process. On the technical side, a differentiator is that Cloud Native PG directly extends uh, the Kubernetes controller uh, by defining a custom resource called the cluster uh, that manages the status of the cluster and that relies on a component that is called instance manager to control the underlying PostgreSQL instance. Uh, this includes failover management, which is what we our you know usual nightmare when we think about these. Okay, so as a result, um, because of this, because we we extend the controller, we don't use a tool like Patroni or Rep Manager, to which, for example, I contributed in the past in the first version of Rep Manager, Stolon, and so on. In order to have final control on the Postgres cluster, we we've made the decision to not to rely on stateful sets but to directly manage PVCs. It goes without saying that without our multi-year experience and active contributions to Postgres, uh, as well as a deep understanding of Kubernetes, this couldn't have been possible. Cloud Native PG is fully declarative and relies on Kubernetes resources to facilitate the integration with applications, such as services, mutual TLS via secrets, affinity control, and so on. Out of the box, it provides observability through endpoints for the native uh, Prometheus exporters, as well as direct uh, login, JSON log um, for, um, to standard output. 
Um, then other important features are backup and continuous, uh, um, continuous backup and point in time recovery, rolling updates, scale up, scale down, and, and much more. Let's go to storage. So storage is the most critical component of a database. That's always been like that. Bare metal, VM, VMs, and uh, Kubernetes as well. And you must plan for day, from day zero to run database workloads. Uh, as I was mentioning before, Cloud Native PG doesn't make use of stateful sets. And you can learn more about why by scanning this QR code. Instead, we directly manage PVCs, uh, which are the most important assets, asset of a PostgreSQL database. Uh, we call it PG data. Our internal motto, indeed, it Cloud Native PG is uh, the PG data is worth a thousand pods. Okay, this is exactly what we say every time. You know, we can't lose data. You know, our prim primary directive is not to lose data. We're storage agnostic, and although we recommend share nothing architectures, you're actually free to choose between local storage, network storage, and hybrid, you know, hybrid solutions. We support dynamic provisioning. And uh, we use storage classes and PVC uh, templates. So one of the amazing, thing, amazing things of uh, Kubernetes is that it, it enables us to uh, build a virtual data center um, using declarative configuration, so infrastructure as code. So I will go through some examples here of architectures um, from the most basic one to a disaster recovery uh, example that spans over multiple regions uh, on Kubernetes clusters. The first architecture relies on shared uh, storage over the network with nodes uh, sharing both the database and application workloads. This second uh, example relies on taints, but you can use also node selectors if you want, to separate applications and dedicate some nodes um, to Postgres workloads while still using uh, shared network storage in this case, as you can see. The third example, we decide to dedicate some storage to Postgres workloads, while in this one we directly attach local storage on the nodes being reserved for Postgres. Here we go even further by dedicating a single node uh, to a single Postgres instance with local storage again. And this example instead describes a three node cluster Postgres cluster with the primary and, the, and two standbys, where each node has local storage and sits in a different availability zone, thanks to uh, topology key. Okay, so we can do this in a, in a declarative way. This final example instead uses the concept of a feature we call replica cluster, uh, where we create another Postgres cluster in a different time, in a different. Um, Kubernetes cluster, which normally is in a different region, and uh, use streaming replication um, with a direct connection. So, of course, you need to go through security and so on to make it um, happen. Otherwise, if you want, you can simply use asynchronous uh, replication with file shipping using an object store that enables to transfer data across regions. Or if you want both, because that's, that's done directly by Postgres. Postgres fall back, falls back in case the network goes down. Okay, so as you can see, just by using Kubernetes, you can easily open up for multi-cloud uh, environments or hybrid cloud environments. It's it's your choice. Okay, so which one to pick? So really, any you know, you can pick any any the one that suits for your use case. So the, amazing, the amazing, thing, amazing thing, as I was saying before, is that thanks to Kubernetes, all of this can be done in a declarative way. That's what makes it special, in my opinion. That's the most important differentiator. I want to share an example. I mean, this is an example to configure a Postgres cluster with three, with three nodes. Uh, we use convention over configuration. You call this MyAppDB. And uh, we have a primary and two standbys. We set the affinity to prefer, you know, uh, using uh, clusters in, in different nodes. And we set the storage for PG data and the stor storage for walls. And this is what happens under the hood. Okay, we, mm, we initialize the first PVC. 
and we run initdb. Initdb is the process that uh, creates uh, uh, the PG data of, of a primary. Um, and uh, once the PVC, PVC is, in, is uh, initialized, we Cloud Native PG starts the pod. And when the pod is up, we uh, define the, the Kubernetes service that will be used by applications. So we have three services, one for read writes, one for read only, and one for read operations. And, uh, and then we use mutual TLS. We said already mutual TLS to communicate with, uh, with the application. You can use TLS certificates. You can integrate that with Cert Manager if you want, all out of the box. Um, then we use PG-based backup, which is backup is the internal tool that allows us to clone the standby. We start the, the pod on the, on the standby. We use, again, mutual TLS to connect in a safe and secure way and, and stream data and so on with the third node. And uh, let's look now at the automated failover cap capability. Uh, what happens when the readiness node on the primary uh, starts to fail. So Kubernetes detects that immediately and lets a Cloud Native PG elect the new primary from the av available replicas. Again, this is done directly by the, by the operator. Okay? The instance manager, which is, I think, the real differentiator of our operator, it, it, that's the process that, the process that uh, controls P1 in the, in the, in the, in the pod. Okay? Um, for the, uh, it, detect, it, it detects uh, that it's the new primary. Sorry, because I'm, I'm not able to see very well. But and updates uh, DRW service accordingly. Then, when the former primary comes back again, the instance manager detects that, and uh, it prevents the, 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 the split brain situation. And uh, once the pod is ready, it reassigns that to the read-only um, service. So, and that's all from me today. So now I'm very happy to pass. You've got to stay around for questions. Where? You've got to stay around for questions, Gabriele. Yeah. You can't run away. No, no, I'm oh, staying no. here. It's good. But... Um, so we're going to flip back a bit and then try and get into the, 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 the demo that I've built. So I think I'm going to point it like that. Uh, can you just move me on a slide? Oh, sorry. What did I? Uh, I don't know what you did. Oh, I know we're still there. It's fine. Where's the clicker? The clicker's there. I'm just gonna use this. I think I blo I, de I destroyed your computer. You've destroyed it. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> Bear with the caller. You should mm -hmm. shift out of the way. So do a little dance. Tell a joke, Gabrielli, just while I fix whatever you've done. Yeah, of course. As you can see, this is you know how it works, the, the failover. And uh, are there any, any questions you, you want? OK, maybe we can ask. Yeah. So does it roll back to the original primary? Like there was like no, OK, that's a, OK. The question is, does it roll back to the original primary? My question is, why? Why should it? Does it matter? OK, so the, the idea here is to just think in terms of cluster, OK? So if, OK, we're back, back on track. So back that's also a differentiator between, for example, stateful sets and our direct control of PVC, because to us it doesn't matter. The important thing is that there's only one primary at a time, you know? But, but yeah, the other thing is, go, do go and read that thing about it doesn't, as a Kubernetes normal person who's been using Kubernetes for about seven, eight years now, I did not understand what was going on when I first started using it because there were no stateful sets, there was no replica sets, there were no deployments, and I went, what is going on? So do go and read the article, it's good, it explains why it does this and why it does, it's a kind of a manual decide to fail over, because you don't want to throw away PG data and then have to resynchronize it. So it makes a lot of sense once you kind of read the documentation from the operator. Um, so I'm gonna try and go really quickly about through these bits and then go through the demo, which I'm gonna try and narrate at the speed of light, which is gonna be very entertaining. Um, the first thing just to say is that the storage, as Gabrielli said, is the most critical. And I think picking the faster storage that you need to actually run your workload is really critical as well. So the demo we're going to show is on a cloud provider, 
but it's actually running on i3EN instances on, on an EKS cluster. So we're going to be running the demo on local NVMe drives. So everything I'm showing you will work on any cloud provider or on-premise or any execution venue. So the demo is deliberately done to show you that this will run anywhere and you can do this the same way. As I said, on that, on the storage layer I'm using, I can do the replication encryption fault tolerance. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and build a demo where we complement the cloud native Postgres components. So things like at rest encryption, which the cloud native Postgres thing does not do, we're going to turn that on on the storage layer so that exactly. we make sure everything's encrypted. Yeah. We've got a contract. Yeah. That's the storage class. And we're only allowed to speak together from now on. That's the contract. <laughs> yeah, OK. Um, but the other thing to say as well, well is we that can. you can very easily turn stuff on and off in the different layers. So to go ahead and just say, I'll just use this storage class without understanding what that storage class does under the covers. If you've got a storage array that's replicating data to a second site, you turn on storage replication and you turn on Postgres level replication, you can end up with 18 copies of the data written to disk. And your, you, you know, your database is only as fast as the slowest write. So please do ask your Kubernetes team what the storage class actually does and what it looks like, because it really does matter. So that's all I want to say there. So in this case, we're going to use a couple of storage classes. It's a Kubernetes talk, so there's some YAML. Uh, we're going to see that in the video, so I'm not going to talk too much in detail, other than just say what you can do with the on that layer is you can just add these annotations. So you can turn on features and turn off features in different storage classes on uh, kind of dynamically. So we will map, and the one on the left has got the storageos.com replicas 2. The one on the right does not have that. So we're going to do replication on the storage class on the left at the storage layer and replication at the Postgres layer on the right-hand side. And the only other thing to say is that we're sort of, we talked about the RTO RPO and we talked about the patterns. The really important thing is to match them, you know, the right component to the right RTO RPO. If you replicate at the storage layer and you only have a single database pod, you will have an outage when we kill the pod or kill a node in our Kubernetes cluster. If you're using Postgres replication, it will just promote a primary, uh, sorry, a standby to be a primary, and you will not have an impact to your application running on your Kubernetes cluster if we kill a node. So think about what your application and your business application design needs and turn the right bits on at the right level. So um, the most important thing there is about the backups and the recovery as well. So again, there's two different ways to do it. The right-hand side is this thing called a volume snapshot class. This is kind of the Kubernetes level way of doing it. So if you've got 1,000 pods, and you need to orchestrate the backup of all of them at the same time to recover an application, you would want to use a, a backup manager, and you want to do some orchestration. So we've got partnerships with people like Kasten and Cloud Casa, for example. So you'd want to use one of these orchestration engines to back everything up at the same time, because it's pointless backing up one thing than the next thing and having all the, your application out of sync. Having said that, that backup and that snapshot will need a pause because you'll need to get consistency. So there will be an application impact to using that kind of backup mechanism. And as Gabrielli said, using the right ahead logs and using this kind of continuous um, you know, backup. Yeah, continuous archiving. Yeah. yeah so you'll have a cool. different recovery point objective and recovery time objective on these two different approaches, faster and slower. So we're going to try and do a demo. Uh, is that plain? Right, I'm going to move to this side and try and narrate it. Um, oh, that is uh, not 1080p in any way, shape, or form, is it? Hold on a second. Yeah, thank you, Google. 360p? <laughs> Honestly. So yeah, but what Chris was saying, it's important. I mean, it, the good thing here is that you have choice I mean, to choose between file system replication or the database one. Anyway, we're back on track. So, so it's going to be a bit small, isn't it? I did try this at home, and it did work OK on, on, on a flat screen monitor, so I did test it. But OK, the video I'll post on my GitHub. I'll put a link in the notes at the end, so you can go ahead, and, and it'll be on the recording as well. But the main thing is at this bottom side, I'm using EKS CTL. So at the very bottom there, there was a set, set of steps, which was to prime the NVMe drive, which, so we're using a local NVMe. So this will work, as I said, in any execution venue. Um, I've got some YAML files up there. So I've got two storage classes, 
And I've also got um, two database files. So what I'm going to do is, I think in a second, is show you the, the storage classes. So in this one, we've got a storage class which has got the, um, which doesn't have the replication triggered in it. But what we know in there, there's one of these annotations is storageos.com forward slash encryption equals true. So every persistent volume, there will be a per persistent volume encryption key created. And then that will be backed off to, by default, of course, it's a Kubernetes secret. So that will go into the Kubernetes etcd. But there's also other projects. So there's an open source project which we've contributed to called Truso. So you can integrate that into something like a HashiCorp vault. So you can have at rest encryption integrated into a key management service. The second one has the replicas set to two. So in this case, we've got a storage class where we turned replication on. So to make sure we don't have these 18 copies of data in the wrong place, what we're going to do is we're going to match the storage classes with the right database. So this is our standalone database. I called it standalone because there's one of them. Thought brilliant naming convention there. And the instances at the top is set to one. So in this case, I've only got a single PG data and a single WAL volume. So at the bottom, um, there's a storage class for the um, well storage, and storage is the PG data storage. So what we want to do is we want to take the standalone database and run it on the replicated storage. And then we're going to have another database, which is going to be the replicated storage. And we're going to run that on this on the um, sorry replicated database. And we're going to run it on the non replicated storage. Now, there's a really nice tool which I found out. How do I know that my databases are healthy and what that, what's going on in the Kubernetes cluster? So Cloud Native Postgres has a kubectl plugin. So kubectl, cmpg, status, and then standalone DB. So you can call that, and it'll tell you what's going on. And the thing you're looking for is there's some OK labels in there. And you can also see things like, which one of my write-ahead logs? How far ahead through my transaction processing am I? And so we've set up basically two databases, and they're nicely running at the right speed, and we've got um, we're using local NVMEs. The great thing about these local NVMEs is their sub-millisecond disk latency for, for writes. So even with three-way replication across three availability zones, so this, is run, this was, demo was recorded in the Dublin, so EU West 1A, 1B, 1C. Even with three-way replica synchronous replication between three different zones, um, we can get about 30,000 IOPS just out of the smallest instances you can, you can get from that class. So we can get more and more workload through these just by beefing up the size of the instances and beefing up the size of the network links, for example. Um, there's also a command line interface to, um, um, to the ONDAT storage layer. So I've got some commands here where I'm just going to you know, pick a persistent volume claim. So this is the thing that is the, you know, the most critical thing that the um, cloud native Postgres keys off. And just to show you, look, there's a, this master line and if we pick another, if we pick another persistent volume claim from the from the replicated database, sorry, the standalone database where we've got storage replication on, what you'll see is there'll be a master, and there'll be a replica and a replica. So I'm just in the video showing you, you know, we're looking at everything under the covers. There's no smoke. There's no mirrors. This is all done there. And the really nice thing about the cloud native Postgres and on that, both of them just key off the Kubernetes.topology.io key. So if your cluster has got topology zones set, then this stuff will just work and give you distribution um, uh, across the availability zones, and it will give you fault tolerance across an availability zone out of the box on either the storage way or on, uh, on the um, uh, Cloud Native Postgres way. Now, of course, everything's happily running. Everything seems to be fine. So like any good demo, we're going to go into the AWS console, and we're going to terminate the instance. So we're going to pull the power out of the back of one of the machines on purpose because that's what we have to survive with at the worst case scenario. So we're going to go in, terminate instance, I'm going to click terminate, and boom, it's gone. Uh, pod not available, pod not available. So we've already killed that. So the, the standalone database has gone, someone's killed the node my pod was running on. So I killed the node, and it was actually one of the standbys, uh, sorry, one of the, uh, yeah, one of the standby instances that was running on the same node as the standalone database. Um, I can set the demo up so we've got the primary and the standalone database running on the same node. I've run through lots of scenarios. It doesn't really matter. All I'm trying to show is the different recovery mechanisms that go on in, under the covers. 
What I found really interesting is there's about, I think it's about 300 second timeouts in Kubernetes, and there was a talk about two before in this room, which was about the new graceful shutdown modes and ungraceful shutdown modes. And I need to go and watch that talk to see what, how it's changed in 1.24, because I, I think there has been some improvements going on, and I'm getting nods from people who've been at the talk. So you've got to wait about five minutes for Kubernetes to notice and start recovering and doing things, depending on which timers you hit. But if you look at the AWS console, there's already four nodes there. So AWS has not waited. There's already another node in the 1B availability zone that's been spun up. And then what we do is we go through and we basically see what's going on, what's so not ready, scheduling, disabled. Kubernetes hasn't even noticed the machine has died yet. Kubernetes is just like, it's not ready, it's not ready. EKS has already actually created a new instance and is trying to join it to the cluster in the background. So there's some really interesting timing things. And the one thing I took away from this is if you're going to do failure and disaster recovery and, and you know, testing, you need to test the timing issues because things can go wrong all over the place, I was finding when I was building the demos and stuff. Correct. So look, it still doesn't know it's, it's gone. It still thinks there's three nodes there. Um, so what will happen, and we can speed up the, the demo a little bit and, and just kind of skip towards the end. What you'll see um, as we go through this is once Kubernetes notices and, and the, the timers have expired, this, for the standalone database, Kubernetes will go, oh, I just need to start the pod again. So Kubernetes will spin the pod up. And because at the storage layer, we were replicating the storage between 1A, 1B, and 1C, the three availability zones, at the storage layer, we'll promote one of the storage replicas to be the master of the storage layer. And that will just connect to the pod, and the pod will start running. And I think I do a bit where I scroll up and I look at the, the right ahead log, just to prove that the, the well log is where we left it. Well, it's actually, it's actually one more, because I think when it does its recovery, it starts a new well log as well yeah, as part of that. Timeline, yeah. On the other one, um, the, the, um, the Postgres, the cloud native Postgres, never recovers automatically as part of the process. And this is deliberate, and this is to say, if you go back and read the design of their operator, this is deliberate and the way it's meant to work. Because for it to recover automatically, you have to basically say, I want to delete PG data and delete the well log from that node. So I'm, I'm willing to throw away that node, and now at a database level, I want to start a resynchronization of PG data and, and the well log. So there's a command which I found out which is nicely automated. <laughs> it's great in the plugin. So kubectl cmpg destroy. It is as disruptive and destructive as it sounds like it is. And you say this database and this instance number. So if you see um, on the top left, I don't know, I, I, was, I almost missed it there. And here we go. kubectl cmpg destroy replica, replicated db2. And what you should have seen in the top left is the pod's back up and happy and running. And in the bottom left, so those were the two CMPG status bo boxes for the standalone database and the replicated database. What you would have seen is those two pods are now back up and, sorry, the, 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 the standalone database with the storage replication has just recovered and is back up and running. There was an outage to the operations. Because until Kubernetes and the timers had all triggered in, and until the pod had been rescheduled, the database was not there and was not alive and was not healthy and not responding to requests. Whereas the replicated DB, the cloud native Postgres database, was happy and was running all the way through. So we've gone through this and um, we've got OK, OK, and we've done a destroy, so that pod will be being restarted. So we've had a database running on a node We've unplugged that node from the Kubernetes cluster in a very, very forceful terminated fashion. And while you've been watching this, and this is real time, within, I think it's about six minutes total elapsed, both of those databases have recovered. And I, the one thing I would say as well, or I took away from it, is I'm not a Postgres person by core background, but the simplicity and the ease and the automation, the operation that this cloud native Postgres stuff, I mean, it was like 15 lines of YAML to just get a database up and running. And it just, it made my life so much easier. And it's really, you know, you see you can build very resilient patterns. So if you want an RTO, RPO of zero, you can use this stuff and you can build, you know, production workloads into Kubernetes now. Um, I'm gonna skip past the last bit of that bit at the end. 
Uh, we're pretty much out of time. And Gabriele, do you want to just do the honours with the conclusions? Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, ultimately, it's all about freedom. I like to say this word because it's it's up to us, and that's what Kubernetes gives us. Okay, open source in general. We have the possibility to run, for example, a full open source stack. And uh, another thing that is important, especially I'm, I'm European. Uh, for the GDPR, for example, is to own our data. We have the possibility now to retain control of the data, full control of the data, and decide if we want the data in on-premise, on, on uh, in multi-cloud, hybrid cloud, whatever, um, using the same, the same infrastructure, by the same configuration. Then cost optimization, maybe you want to uh, more, add more about this, you know. Yeah, so um, if, you, if you want to run the database at the lowest price point, and it's a very data-intensive workload, you will not find a cheaper way than running it on local NVMEs. No one's ever done that because there's no, no one ever thinks to do it, maybe. But using something like Ondat, that's a CSI plugin that can orchestrate local NVMEs, and you get that sub-millisecond response, so you can do massive volumes of transactions through your databases. Yeah, correct. And uh, again, I mean, this is something that I'm really happy because we learned a lot working with, with, uh, with Chris and his team. We are database people, with storage people. We actually understood each other's point of view, and I think we, we are much better now. I think we have a better understanding of everything. And then finally, DevOps, because if we are here, in my opinion, it's because we have done a journey uh, that puts closer developers and, data and uh, database administrators and infrastructure administrators. The good thing about Kubernetes, uh, Cloud Native PG is that it is designed to work with applications. So it's a database that by itself doesn't have any, any means, any goal, okay? It doesn't solve any goal, but it's through applications that we, we give yeah, value. I, I, it's been a great lot of fun. Um, I think we need to wrap up now. We're at the end of our time. We'll hang around for questions. Um, we've also got a draw for a massive Lego Batwing at the Ondat booth. So if anyone wants to come and try and win that, there's only about 40, 50 people entered, so there's a really good chance. We're at the back right-hand corner of the, um, of, the, um, uh, of the exhibition hall, and we're going to do the draw at half past five. So if anyone wants to come and try and win that, come along. Business cards here if anyone wants to get in touch afterwards. But... Do we, have to, do we do questions live? We do questions. Uh, no, thanks, Gabriel. Thanks, Chris. Uh, come we up are and running do out of time. But if you have questions, you can still come and talk to him. We are stopping the recording. But thank, thank you very you much. Very much.